Cool. Um, welcome, Paris and John. Hi. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for the setting up. Max, you know, they just yeah. don't work. Um, they just work. We're John and Paris. We've recently returned from a trip to the 90s, and we're here to talk about all sorts of things. Aren't these pictures great? <laughs> these are from a conference. All conferences should do headshots like that. Uh, we make games uh, and write books. We build a lot of kids' games for iconic Australian brands like the ABC and Qantas and things like that. And we write a lot of books about things that are not games, uh, like Swift. But we also write a lot of books about things that are games, like these. Uh, we're not really here to talk about us, though. We're here to talk about why open data and video games is a really cool thing to do. And we're going to start by talking about the situation, which sounds a lot more ominous than it actually is. So lately, there's been this fashion, this trend of governments releasing a lot of open data. It's very, very cool. Governments like the word innovation a lot, and they've heard that making data available is a way to get that sweet, sweet innovation. And this is not just in Australia, this is all around the world. Uh, it happens a lot. Yeah. Alongside this, hackathons are really fashionable. Yeah. They're really popular both in the public and the private sector. Uh, you might have already been to a few of them. Um, companies run hackathons. Uh, Often, like there's, there's consultants who run the hackathons for large companies with uh, the, uh, with a view to turning into an inexpensive opportunity for R&D concepting. So we're not going to go into the ethics of hackathons today, but the gist here is that hackathons are absolutely everywhere, and uh, they're great fun if you know what you're doing. The basic idea is that you put a whole bunch of nerds into a room, uh, let them stew for a weekend, and then at the end you have innovation. We literally is... mean stew. <laughs> so once you've extracted the innovation stuff happens, that's the idea. Uh, one of our favorite hackathons is GovHack, which was mentioned earlier by Matt. We absolutely love GovHack. We've been doing GovHack ever since it first ran in Hobart, and we almost flew to the mainland to do it before that, but we got distracted by something else. Um, GovHack is amazing. GovHack is an Australian, New Zealand-wide, open government data source hackathon thing. Um, it's lots and lots of fun. Huge amounts of really cool stuff gets made. Uh, some really great ideas appear. Lots of nerds stew in rooms, <laughs> doing cool stuff with, with data and visualizing it in all sorts of unique and interesting ways. But GovHack fundamentally has the same problem as other hackathons. Hackathons are really fun, but they have this issue of reinforcing a culture of work until you can't. So um, they promote fairly unhealthy uh, work models. Um, but that isn't the main problem that we want to talk about today. The real problem is that hackathons are often very oriented around producing very product-like results. They encourage you to come up with a web app of some kind, a mobile app of some kind that'll, that'll solve whatever problem the event organizers have in mind. They're very producty, business-oriented solutions, and we, we just like making games. And we think one of the problems with the producty, business-oriented solutions that often come out of these hackathons is they're never followed up on. Yeah. People promise themselves that they'll follow up on this cool thing they made and people will be engaged with it, but they never do. And then it sits there languishing on some instance of some sort of thing they've spun up. And then when they eventually forget to pay the bill or run out of free credit, it dies and goes away forever. So game jams kind of embrace this. So a game jam is a hackathon that's focused on making games. Um, raise your hand if you have uh, heard of the term game jam before. OK, about half of you. Cool. So a game jam aims to do two things. They never aim to create product-like uh, things as their main outcome. Instead, the main goal is to make something, and more importantly, to have a finished something at the end of whatever time duration the hackathon is. The other objective of Game Jams is to show something cool, really cool. Uh, game developers are very shallow people. Uh, they like to impress their friends. They, they like to show things on Twitter of what they've made. Uh, they're often a lot more social than the type of people we encounter at hackathons, which is something we would really love to fix. They, would, they want to get out there and show stuff rather than build something for their own amusement. And they're really competitive. We often see a lot of competition at hackathons, and we'd love them to embrace the, the game jam like ethos of building something together rather than competing with each other. Mm -hmm. Prizes happen, uh, but they're an afterthought. They're not the goal. Uh, hackathon, hackathons are often more explicitly competitive. So we mentioned that um, game jam games tend to not be very productized. Um, the goal is to make something and then immediately abandon it. You will still get people going, oh man, this is cool, I want to finish it. But the cool thing about games is they don't need to have users or customers in order to be a viable thing. Games can stand on their own. And you can derive all the meaning out of a game by playing it once or twice rather than having to use it regularly. 
So um, one exception to that, uh, Towerfall is a phenomenally successful game. It's available on most platforms uh, except for the Xbox. Um, and uh, it originally came out of a game jam in Vancouver. Products do come out of uh, game jams, but it's very much the exception. Because game jams are more for practice and for honing your skills than they are for uh, producing a thing that you can go and sell. There was one exception, actually. Um, so, the, uh, so Ludum Dare uh, in 2014 actually hosted a, uh, a session that was designed around let's make a game and then you put it to market and then the goal is you win if you make $1 in sales. So, so our point here is that game jams are basically hackathons with a slightly different ethos and spirit behind them. And we'd love to see some of that come across to hackathons. What we're going to talk about next is why we attempt to shoehorn video games into various serious contexts like GovHack in the first place. Uh, and the first thing we want to say about that is that games really do matter, uh, even in serious environments. Games have a place in the land of suits and devastatingly powerful shoulders like managers might wear. Um, and more people should be exposed to that. Games can teach you things. Games can make you understand things you previously didn't understand in a way that doesn't actually make you realize you're understanding it until you do understand it. Now this admittedly is very hand wavy at this point, we'll hopefully give you some examples later on in the presentation, but people really take things away from games much faster than they might do a web app with a map on it. And we, we love web apps with maps on them, but games are also really cool. Games engage you in ways that static data presented in more traditional ways does not. So now we're gonna talk about what we've done in the last three or four years of GovHack and various other hackathons. We're mostly drawing examples from GovHack because they're visually the prettiest and we like to show things off. So here are the um, examples of us smashing the ideas of uh, open data hackathons and game jams. What we approached this with was this idea of twisting the concept of what the hackathon was about into an excuse to have a game jam for ourselves. Without being jerks about it. Um, it would be very possible to go into a non-game related hackathon and be a massive jerk take it over and ignore what the event is about and build a game. We try not to do that, though we probably have done it sometimes. Mm. Um, the real trick is to work within the context of what the event is for in the first place. So let's look at how we can do this effectively. Our thoughts are that anything can be turned into a game. There's play in any context. So to give an example, um, the Global Game Jam um, sets a theme every year for what the games should be about. And the themes are weird. Like, uh, in 2009, it was, as long as we have each other, we will never run out of problems. That was the theme for the game. People were making games based on that. So, or, like, if you can make a game out of the theme of Sound of a Heartbeat, yeah. not the phrase Sound of Heartbeat, but actually just like, Last year's theme, theme was, what do we do now? Yeah. It's great, and I, I really wish serious hackathons could embrace some of this absurdity. Mm. So every single one of these themes resulted in an awesome game. So with that in mind, there's no real reason why taxes can't be an awesome theme for a game. Or census information as a source of a game. Or energy efficiency ratings for household appliances. And it just so happens that that's actually a source of data that was available uh, for us to use at GovHack. So we made a game called Marvelous Ultimate Appliance. Thank you. Does anyone actually get that pun? Yeah. Please. Yes, a few of you. Fantastic. Okay, no one else at the event That's did. the first time anyone's ever got the pun, as far as we know. <laughs> anyway, so our thought process for this was, household appliances all have these stats on them. So you, the, the energy star rating you see, the, uh, the stickers that tell you how good it is. Um, and it just so happens that the Department of Science collects the stats for every device sold in Australia and makes them available on data.gov.au, which is amazing. So we have all these stats and we have all these objects why don't we make them battle? <laughs> <laughs> so we got to work. Um, we first of all worked out what the rules of the game would be like. So we put together a really, really simple card game. It's vaguely Pokemon uh, inspired. There's another top notch pun there, by the way. It's not rocket appliance. Uh, do you get it? Um, <laughs> and then we started pulling down uh, data provided from uh, the government. So um, information about ex actually how those uh, star ratings get computed. As well as that, we pulled down stats on individual pl uh, appliances. And this is just all stuff. stuff you available. know, manufacturers have to submit all this stuff to the government to sell this in Australia. And they collect it all and it's available. Hmm. So then we process cool. them into um, just information that an application can use. Just bring it down to... Um, just, 
uh, normalized stats, so like cost, amount, um, goodness in attack strength, goodness in defense strength, based on those uh, raw information. And yeah, the, the, the end result is a really, really simple uh, card game where you can uh, take turns uh, buying appliances and then you make them fight. <laughs> so um, just going to quickly show a, a silent video just as the uh, thing goes. So I think you need to hit the next button. Cool. So uh, players um, take turns, first of all, purchasing their appliances from the in-game shop. They're given some money at the start, and so we pull that information. We actually, the, the, uh, these values are, the costs are derived from their efficiency and uh, you know, usefulness. So we're, we're buying them, we're There's adding actually a few layers data. of things going on here. The, the starting money you start off with is some other data we fudged in, which was average household income for where you are. Yep. So it, it goes a little bit deeper than just this data from the appliances, but you get the idea. So now the players have got the two uh, appliances they want to fight with. So now they choose which ones to attack with. Player two chooses cards to defend with. And then we have an appliance battle. And so it's just comparing the scores and the winner goes there. And yeah, you win the game if you manage to uh, reduce your opponent's money to zero. So after a couple of days of people playtesting this with us, we found we all had a very intimate understanding of which washing machine we should buy next. Yeah. And surprisingly, this actually did give us a really good knowledge of the energy efficiency of appliances that we had. And we've been paying attention to it ever since because we are geeks and we fixate on things like that. And this was enough to nail it into our head that it actually worked. So our point here was this game was kind of stupid. It's Pokemon with washing machines. But because we presented this otherwise dry data set in this way, people started paying attention to it. So in the uh, year after that, we uh, realized that there's a lot of information about political process encapsulated in data provided by the government. So we made a game in which players uh, yell at each other about uh, whose fault the problems are. Um, we made uh, What is Gov? So it actually turns out that the transcripts of every single uh, debate and things going on in uh, the Senate and in the House of Reps uh, is captured by the hand side. Who here has not heard of what the hand side is? Raise your hand. A few views. So the Hansard are basically the official transcript. So there's, of lot, there's a lot of data about the Commonwealth government, and we'll come back to the Hansard later. Um, one of the really cool pieces of data that comes out of the Commonwealth government is this agency's functions list, which basically breaks down everything that every government department does in terms of roles, very similar to, say, an RPG, <laughs> <laughs> um, and tells you who's responsible for what. So we took almost every government department. We cut out some because we didn't want to offend people because there were some, you know, there's a lot, the government does a lot of stuff and we don't want to have to talk about that in the context of a game. So we took some of it out just to be polite and we matched it all with their responsibilities. We, we learned a lot of R and Python and weird data manipulation things while we were doing these games. Very quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> and we created a whole bunch of scenarios that could be resolved using these, yeah, these uh, skills, responsibilities of the different government departments. So we broke it down into as low a level as we could go. So curing cancer, who's responsible for the hospitals, obviously. And we built this game. This is called What is Gov? So the game involves players. Uh, it's actually a networked multiplayer game. We'll talk more about that in, in, in a second. Why that's a mistake. Um, in which uh, the game assigns problems to people and, they, and also a collection of people as well. So like government roles. Has anyone played Space Team? Yeah. We ripped yep. off Space Team. Yeah, it's Space Team. Um, <laughs> So people are trying to uh, solve problems. They may not have the people um, necessary to solve the problems uh, locally, but the other players in the game might. So you're saying, I need someone to invent Wi-Fi. Who can do that? And so that you, you're yelling at each other in, uh, uh, throughout the game. So oh, uh, we probably need some sound. Oh, hit that button, yeah? Yeah, nice, cool. So yeah, and this is what it looks, looks like outside of this uh, fairly dry screen environment. Again? Alright. Alright, Ally asking for peacekeepers. Clear oh. runway. I've got these. Protect him here. Clear the runway. 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 Clear the the, the Honourable Michael Ferguson, MP in Tasmania, came to visit GovHack and beat everyone. <laughs> and that's, that's him just after he won. Um, that was pretty great, and that kind of pointed to the idea that we were doing something right with yeah. these games. Um, 
So the year after, which was last year, I believe, we made another one. And I promise we'll stop going through games we've made in a moment. Uh, we made a quiz game about how elected politicians vote on the issues. Now, this is a fairly common concept in terms of using open data from all sorts of countries. The UK has a lot of really cool stuff like this. ABC does a lot of stuff like this with Vote Compass. We thought we could go one better. Um, so we made a game called Question Time. Now, going back to what John was saying before with the Hansard, everything all the politicians say in the government is logged in the Hansard. And it is beautifully semantically broken up into pieces. It's provided as a big XML file you can download from the Parliament House website, telling you exactly how they voted, what they said, when they said it, who they are, where they're from. It is actually amazing that it comes out like this. Um, as a complete aside, there are several really cool research papers on how they do this. They have a really complicated uh, voice to action system where they can say keywords to trigger who's speaking, which adds it to the system and they keep typing. It's actually amazing, look it up. It's, it's voice shorthand. It's voice shorthand, it's really cool. And a lot of it runs on Linux, check it out. Yep. Really cool. Uh, but we looked at the hand side, we looked at this thing called They Vote For You, which originated in the UK and then got ported to Australia, which basically tracks how people vote for different issues, pulling that hand side data. And we thought, well, the websites where you plug in your postcode and see who voted for what are kind of dull, but necessary. So why not make some silly pictures of your politicians? <laughs> this was before the spill, by the way. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> make some silly pictures of your politicians and uh, quiz people on how they voted to challenge people. So we made this game. Yeah, this was a competitive quiz game in which uh, players uh, are given questions, in this case here, how does Tony Abbott feel about this issue? And you slide a slider saying, oh, strongly disagree, strongly agree. And then that data came from the, the uh, They Vote For You um, data set, which came from Hansard. So this is multiplayer again, multiple people on different devices. Hansard's data is absolutely amazing. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, this is the sort of data you can get out of Hansard. As you can see, it's really, really cleanly broken up. It basically screams to make a game out of it, yeah. in our opinion. Um, Pal Pass is this thing that originated in the UK, which lets you pass the Hansard data in a really usable, useful fashion. So we, we glommed it together and created a what we think is a pretty engaging game from a reasonably dry but necessary concept. And we'll show you the full video of that particular game at the end of the presentation before we wrap up. So the, the way you'd make an engaging game from really dry context is by realizing that every game is based out of systems. And coincidentally, the world is built out of systems. Now, this doesn't mean that everything in the world can be a game, but it does mean that you can find those similarities between the two environments and then find out which parts are fun. So let's talk about preserving the spirit and meaning of what the data sets represent and what the events are for in your games. You should not try to model real-world processes. You shouldn't try and go, oh, I know, um, we'll, we'll create a system in which we, uh, it's, it's mapping the voting systems and the actual procedures. That's not fun. P politicians are not like grinning their heads off as they vote, except in special circumstances. Um, but, and at the same time, though, taking liberties is totally fine. So it's totally fine to try and maintain the overall theme, but also making sure that what you're doing is close enough to uh, a fantastical environment to let the players have fun. When we first started doing this, we would have group arguments about how realistic we should try and be. And we kind of settled on a sweet spot of realistic enough to explain what's going on, but not detailed realism. The goal here is to make people understand things, see the underlying theme and not lose sight of it, not to give them an absolute in-depth understanding of something. If you're engaging them on the topic that they previously were not engaged on, that's absolutely enough. So when you're making these kinds of games, especially in a hackathon or game jam, especially when those game jams are judged and there are prizes, um, you need to engage three different groups of people. The first is obviously um, the key person, the player. You want to make sure that people are having fun while playing the game. Fairly straightforward. But at the same time, though, and just as importantly, you need to make sure that your fellow participants are as engaged as well, because they're the ones who are running around making word of mouth stuff happen for you, and it's generally um, extending your personal brand. Um, <laughs> and finally, and perhaps much less importantly, you need to engage whoever deals out the prizes. Now, we've gone into every one of these hackathons saying, we're never going to win this. This is way too stupid, what we're doing. Let's build it anyway. And then we end up winning something. This is completely not the objective, and if you go into it trying to win something, you won't have fun, and you'll just make it a stressy work day, and you, what's the point? We have seen teams who have gone in with the express purpose of, oh, there's some good prizes, let's, let's try and win that, um, and they end up yelling at each other all the time, and it never looks like it's ha they're having fun. The only concession that we make is, typically, GovHack awards separate prizes for use of separate data sets, so we try and shoehorn 
additional data sets into our games so that you know we barely qualify for a few extra prizes. Well, that often helps actually make the game better because you start interrelating things that you previously didn't think about. Yeah. So engagement. Multiplayer is absolutely the best way to do this. It's a lot easier to be fun when you are shouting at other people. Yeah. Yeah. Completely obvious, but yeah. in hindsight, yeah. It also gives you a couple of production uh, gains as well, because if you're making a multiplayer game, suddenly you don't need to write an AI. So that makes it a lot easier for you. And it also means that it's really fun to show in person. Because it's very difficult to uh, get a third party watching a person playing a computer game and get them excited. Um, but if you see a person watching two people yell at each other over a computer screen, that's really fun to watch. This is why YouTube and Twitch streamers always scream at the screen when they're playing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people want to see a game between actual players. And if you've got an AI, it's just not that great. Um, and demo videos are much better when they're full of people rather than full of screenshots. As you saw. Now, the problem with multiplayer is actually implementing multiplayer is really hard. Yeah. Uh, especially in like a two-day hackathon. So do local multiplayer if you can. Pass and play is basically as good as mm. for these sort of things. So tablet device, pass it to the next person and so on. Sometimes it isn't always possible, in which case you will want to do it over a network. If you do that, never do it over the internet. Um, just ignore the internet completely. It doesn't exist. Everyone is all in the same room. Nobody will play this game once everyone leaves that room. You can assume a LAN. That's why for last year's GavHack, we had a Google SRE write our server and go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, turn base is also easier than real time, obviously, because doing real time is insane. Don't yeah. do that. Um, if you must do real time, you can go really simple and only do one thing at a time because then you're not insane. Yeah. There's a number of things you also that you can um, just get away with in the context of a game jam or hackathon. You can have, the, the the overriding goal here is to avoid being clever. Um, so. You can make all kinds of uh, horrible decisions that would not fly in production. You can make all kinds of assumptions about the environment. For example, on the network, you can ignore latency. You can assume unlimited bandwidth. You can poll the server and there's no contention. It's fine. Um, you can ignore cheating. Don't even bother trying to prevent it. You can trust the client. You know, uh, one, one of the main problems in, in network multiplayer video games is take a shooting game, client tells the server, hey, I killed player B, and the, and the server goes, yeah, all right. Um, you, can, you can do that in the game jam, that's fine. You can forget long-term balance and replayability. You can, you can design a game that is only fun in the first 30 seconds. That's fine. It'll be seen for 30 seconds and no more. And again, this is a, an interesting point to make because it has nuances that rely on you playing a lot of games. But if you play a game once or twice for maybe a couple of minutes each time and then never come back to it again, you've played the game still. Whereas if you make a web service that somebody has to use to do something, they may use it once to do something and then never come back to it. And that's fine, but perhaps not less than ideal for a web service. Whereas a game is designed like that from the beginning. Uh, Think about it. Memories of having played a game are often better than um, actually playing the game itself. So yeah, your players, like the longest that a player will ever spend playing a game will be 15 minutes at most. So, so yeah, I'm still not sure how I feel about this, but you will often never return to the code, as we said with most hackathons. Uh, yeah. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know yet. But it does mean that you can do things like ignore best practices, just make it work at all. Um, throw in every hack you can find, just cludge the thing together, forget about making it work right. Because really, this is not a code base that needs to be maintained. Now at the same time though, we said this before, we're making games and we wanna make sure that we are trying to not walk in and disregard the goals of the event organizers because they're, you know, they're, they're paying for a lot of stuff um, and you're walking in and taking advantage of that. Um, so it's very, very uh, impolite to walk in and uh, uh, not stay on message. So you need to remain very relevant to the context of the event. It's worth keeping in mind, if you are making a game in a hackathon, you're already being subversive just by doing a game in the first place. So don't make a really, really wacky game that's really unapproachable. Instead, just say, oh yeah, we did a game. And they'll go, really, a game? So yeah, this also really helps to keep your design simple. Yeah, don't get too weird with the idea. Uh, just keep. Simple design works well and cut mercilessly until you have something that works. Or steal it. Uh, but, but cut often, cut early. Cut in the direction of the theme. And one thing that we've found absolutely helps that people freak out when we do this at hackathons is we take a friend who is an audio engineer um, because sound in games is actually amazing and goes a long way to selling the experience. Yeah. 
people will mostly comment on the music first and then go, oh yeah, there's a game fun too. Yeah. So some advice just for jams in general, hackathon. This is not just for games. Time is your enemy in a, in a timed event, but not in the way that you think. Because when an event has a time limit, it fosters a very deadline-oriented mindset. You know, this feeling of someone says, okay, your time starts now. That will often put a lot of people into this mood of um, we only have 48 hours, quick, you know, we've got to crunch. But the problem is that all nighters lie to you. They, the, the idea is, oh no, if I don't sleep, then I'll have more time. Much like anything, you'll never do your best work if you work at all on an all-nighter. Um, so when you go to a game jam and subvert it after you've seen this presentation, don't stay up all night. Uh, go home. Yeah. Your productivity drops the longer you're awake. I yes. made that graph at 4 a.m. Yes. <laughs> so go home at night, please, and get a good night's sleep. It really does help. And then you can arrive rested at a decent time and mock the other teams mercilessly and get a better quality result. The judges, if there are judges, are not going to care about how much work was done. I mean, that's true of anything. You know, the goal is the quality of the end result, not how much work you did. So don't, don't try and kill yourself uh, for this kind of thing. It, it's, it's never worth it. Cutting mercilessly is also a really good way to make sure you don't work all night. Yeah. So we've gone really fast. Uh, we're going to talk about one final thing, which is preserving the meaning with games of the data you're trying to work with. And we have one really quick piece of advice related to that, which is you often don't actually need to. Um, raising engagement in the topic rather than going in depth is enough as far as we can tell. We've not, no science to back this up just based on people playing games we've built and seeing other people play other people's games. It's really easy to make someone aware of something they previously didn't care or didn't even think about just by going on the tip of the iceberg rather than going deep. And if you've done that, you've absolutely succeeded. And that's one of the things games is great at because people will immediately want to and be engaged by a game if it's a reasonable game. So you might be thinking, well, okay, but why do any of this in the first place when a, uh, it feels weird to, to walk in and, and actively subvert the goal of uh, these kinds of, of organizations? And we get asked, well, outside of the context of hackathons, you guys make games, how, how do I get started making games? And our answer is always, well, the best way to do it is to make a game. I mean, that's true for anything. You, know, you get better at doing a thing by doing that thing. But the problem is, games are large and challenging to make. And part of that problem is that games are often seen as very big projects. People, especially people who are novices to game development, will see games like Call of Duty, or they'll see games like Morrowind, or all the other I want to make an MMO that has support for 10 million concurrent players, right. voice acted dialogue for everybody, and 7,000 connected worlds. Yeah, that's going to cost you $15 million every to start. month. Every month, yes. yeah. Um, because people want to make the games that they enjoy playing. And that's fine, but the games they like playing are big and they're expensive. So if you use external pressure put upon you from, uh, f from an event like a hackathon, you can constrain yourself. This is actually the biggest reason we go to game jams. We really like open data. We really like open knowledge. We really like open things. We also really like building games. And we often promise ourselves internally that we'll build a game of our own. And then we don't because we get busy with a client project or something else that's urgent. So by forcing ourselves to work on a game at an event like this, we have fun doing the thing that we really enjoy making and also have a constrained amount of time to actually do it in so we don't procrastinate. And it works really well. Yeah. It's fun for us as developers. It's fun for uh, the players who play the game. And it's also a lot of fun for the event organizers. So just to wrap things up, um, the, uh, the video that you're about to see is the, um, the, the final product of the most recent GovHack. So you actually don't submit a build of, uh, of the game. You actually don't give them the game itself because... It makes the build available as well, but they don't look at that for the judging. Yeah, um, because uh, hackathons uh, like GovHack tend to be like large, complicated apps. Often they might be apps that you need to download and install on an iOS device, and distribution for that becomes uh, annoying. Um, so they just judge entirely on a video. So this is the video that the judges were seeing um, uh, that explains the reason, first of all, why a game and also why this game. Should Very be. silly. Yes. Play? Who's going to start? Uh, one more. Question time. A game of policy. Does anyone really remember how their representatives vote in Parliament? Probably not. I don't really know how anyone votes. 
Despite the existence of powerful web-based tools like They Vote For You and ABC's Vote Compass, people often don't know how their representatives are directing their votes. We built a multiplayer game to make understanding and engaging with the decisions made by Parliament more exciting and memorable. Our game is called Question Time and it combines data from Hansard, Australia's edited transcripts of parliamentary debates and divisions, data from ABC's Vote Compass and data generated by the Open Australian Parser. We heavily prototyped a number of game concepts centred around the idea of presenting an MP and quizzing the player on how they voted on various issues. With our concept ready to go, we started the hacking. Yeah. Our back-end server is built in Go, Google's new powerful and modern systems programming language, and our front-end in Swift, Apple's new programming language. The heart of a great project is the visuals, so we made sure to create a number of truly inspiring caricatures of a selection of representatives to show off the concept, as well as a stunning custom user interface. Question Time is played by two players, with each selecting an MP and a portfolio area. Both players then answer questions about both portfolio areas from the perspective of their chosen MP. Questions are answered by choosing where their MP might stand on a spectrum of strongly disagree to strongly agree, or choosing to abstain. At the end of the game, the player who came closest to choosing their MP's real opinions, in line with their votes in Parliament, is declared the winner. Data drawn from the results of ABC's Vote Compass, showing the opinion of Australians on issues related to the questions asked, is then presented to the players as an endgame summary. The member has Question Time helps people better understand how their MPs are voting on a variety of issues. By wrapping this vital understanding of democracy in action in an exciting game, citizens are more likely to engage with it, becoming better informed, engaged and excited by politics. I've played your game. And now I understand it all! The member will leave under 94A. We've opened all our code, art, music, sound and data on GitHub. Our team of coders, data wizards, audio and visual artists and others is based in Hobart, Tasmania, where we can often be found coding, researching, making good art and engineering. Thanks for watching. Check out the website for more information. Not authorised by the Australian Government Canberra. Spoken by Arabella. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, so that's everything we had to say. I think we've got yeah, eight minutes or more, depending on how we started that timer, for any questions. Or you can just tweet us at any point. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll probably have to share a microphone now. Yeah. Does anyone question? have a question? So I actually wanted to know if you put all the code that, uh, of the games that you're doing as open source, but I saw that at least for this one you did. Yes. We, we try to for all of them. Uh, and that's great. And I wonder if that at any point gets picked up or forked by anyone who thinks about continuing this or doing something similar out of your projects? So I believe the, I haven't tracked this very much because I haven't had time, much like everything with a hackathon, I'd love to follow it up but always forget. The, the space team type game where they're answering questions, the what is gov one, where they're answering questions about functions of government, that was forked by somebody who was trying to make something else out of it in the UK with a similar theme. But I haven't tracked the others. But I suspect they have been, they, they, get, they pick up a reasonable audience on GitHub. Whether people do anything with them or not, who knows. I would love them to, and I would love to maintain them properly. But it's a hackathon. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Hello. Hey. Um, first, quick comment. Um, well, I'll make it a question. Um, why do you think you're subverting GovHack by making games? Uh, GovHack is like really, like it's totally open, you can make anything. I agree, and subverting is a strong word that we deliberately picked because lots of people go into these hackathons which talk about how you can use APIs, how you can make visualizations with maps and charts, and the hackathons present that stuff up front strongly, which implies often whether they want to or not that games are not welcome. Oh, yeah, I think that's... Gov, GovHack right. very much is one of the ones... Everyone loves your, your what is Gov. <laughs> that's great, but... I watching the video in Melbourne. Was Gov, GovHack was our example here, and it does not, not really apply to just GovHack when we say subverting, but lots of hackathons say, you know, come and play with our API, and then we don't need that API at all for the hackathon, mm -hmm. and we build a game. So, like, we went to the Qantas hackathon, which was running mid last year, and they're like, play with our APIs. We've got all these APIs. You can pull up booking data and stuff. We completely ignore that and made a game again, and cool. nobody else did. And that subverting was, Qantas is a good thing. Yes. Um, 
My actual question, um, what game would you make with a data set of 500,000 trees? Trees. That's interesting. I, I've wanted to do something with a, like a, a nature, like mapping based game for a long time. But the problem is it's really hard to get a map into a game in a reasonable way. And we'd probably try and tackle that this year if we can. So come back to me at GovHack this year and we'll try. Remind me. My first thought would be uh, make it some kind of strategy game, turn based strategy game, territory ca capture of some kind. Me again. So I have another question. Um, did you ever think about doing games that are also going backwards with the data? So something like, um, for example, I, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. We have games about like Wikidata, where players, you know, choose the gender of stuff with the you know data, where we then collect that in order to improve the data that we have. So yeah, you're talking about like gamifying your existing processes. Yes. And, yeah. So something like you know, instead of just learning, also learning from the players' you know answers, collecting. Those those can work really well, but the problem is that. Um, it's more challenging to make a game where you have a specific non-fun related outcome in mind uh, really fun for the player in the first place. So um, yeah, I, those those kinds of activities are really worthwhile. Um, one, one of the things that we do with our uh, with our game implementations is we actually we we use the open data as a foundation and then we build off that. So for example, what is Gov? Um, we uh, took all of the information on uh, government departments and their responsibilities, and then we actually fabricated a whole bunch of, uh, of scenarios. So things like you, you would have seen in the list there, invent Wi-Fi. That's not actually in a list of things that a government is like told to do. But we said, if you wanted to, then that's how you do it. So they're, they're accurate, but they're enough to make a game out of. And yeah, it's hard, hard, really hard to work backwards because then you're not with the standard gamification problem where you're trying to gamify something by putting a layer on rather than actually making it go deep. That's really hard. <laughs> this guy has a microphone. Hey. Um, so in New Zealand, when the government runs hackathons, they have this really bad habit of making all these cool APIs available during the hackathon, and then they either never become publicly available or take years and years and years to happen. What's the track record of... Australian government organizations for actually making these things available for apps afterwards? I don't know, but I suspect somebody else in the room might be able to answer that. John might have a comment. Yeah, um, I, don't, I can't really speak for APIs because uh, typically what we're working with are static downloaded offline stuff. We're not trying to query something and then make that run as part of the game, mostly because of latency. Uh, because we, when you end up with a situation where the, uh, where the game is uh, reliant on um, keeping the player engaged, waiting for the API to return can be an issue. Um, yeah, so I think the GovHack organizers would kill any government department that tried that on. Um, you know, making an API available temporarily for during competition. Um, yeah, it's just not on. I, I've I've seen I've seen it with other hackathons. Like, uh, it was it wasn't Bing. It was one of the other mapping providers that did something similar. Um, yeah, I think it's a complete waste of time. Um, you know, I wouldn't participate in in an event like that. I do know that when it comes to private, um, privately run hackathons, typically like they have proprietary data and they'll only make that available for the duration of it because you know it's their thing. But in the case of government, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Occasionally, you'll see something like that. They'll put out a really high quality data set and then they won't maintain it, but at least it's still open. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Cool. Um, thank you very much.